come in this evening, we're going to be looking at uh, 10 rules of risk management in 10 movie quotes. And I say rules, it's really stuff what you might need to know, but that didn't fit too well in the title. So, you know, think of these as rather loose rules, to say the least. <clears throat> we're going to need a little bit of participation tonight, and in order to you know, help engage you all, we have prizes, which we're going to be giving out. Fantastic. We've got the game show. <laughs> what we're after. Higher. Sorry, we have prizes tonight. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Don't make me do the Bruce Lee. You said 24th September. <laughs> oh, near enough. Near enough. Oh, 24th was payday. That's what it was. Um, <laughs> you shouldn't take that off, are you? <laughs> So, we have prizes we're going to be giving out tonight. I, I will tell you that these have been emptied from our marketing cupboard where I work, but they are the old ones. This is not shameless marketing. This is stuff that they said, please get rid of it because we don't want to throw them away. They're very nice. They're very nice. All right. Gemma, are they nice? They're very nice. They're very nice pens. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> So we're going to be looking at these 10 rules through 10 movie quotes. And the idea is that um, you have to guess the movie and the person who said it in the movie. And there is a... Movie, uh, actor, actress, or the character? The character. Right. The character. Thank you. Nice clarification. Objective. <laughs> 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 I think you need to prize that, man. Yeah, Let's get it started. Yeah. Stuff to get through. <laughs> <laughs> what if I guess the writer? <laughs> 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 Have we got any smart-ass prizes? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so there's a prize for guessing the film, a prize for guessing the character. We've got some bonuses at the end, in which we can win some more prizes. One prize per person for the time being. I, you know, I don't want the guy who actually spends all day watching films to go away with 40 pence. I think that's probably a little bit excessive. So for the time being, one prize per person. If you have already won and you know the answer, nudge your neighbour, get them to answer. Let's, let's, uh, let's be fair about this. There are rules and conditions which you can see there. Oh, sorry. Uh, so... Are we ready to start? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Fantastic. Jaws. I heard someone over here first. And who's the character? Oh, uh, oh shut up. Yes. There you go. I think you got the you got yours, didn't you? Yeah, I think you got yours. No, who else was it? She got both. No, 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 no. So, what was the film? Jaws. Right, someone over there. There we go. Right, we're going to get into a rhythm here. Okay. So the first thing, let's check. Police Chief Martin Brody. Jaws. Fantastic. So, so what? I hear you all cry. Okay. <laughs> Maybe on the next one. So, don't underestimate your risks. Is the is the uh, is the moral to this story? So, the thing is, what I often hear is, we're a small company. Nobody's going to hack us. It's not going to happen. But the, the, the reference that's um, up here on the first bullet point is from a, a, a chap called Brian Krebs. He runs a blog. Um, does a, you know an awful lot of you know, good entries, good good um, good blogs. And he analysed the semantic review from 2011. He found that um, attacks on small companies has, has increased dramatically. So the old adage that nobody notices, that nobody knows who we are, doesn't really stand true anymore. <clears throat> you also have to make sure, obviously, that you're measuring those risks when you find them effectively and accurately. And don't think that a pandemic isn't going to happen to you, especially if you're a global organisation. Right? They didn't think it was going to happen in Japan or Mexico. It happens around there. And that's going to cause disruption to you. So, you know, don't ever underestimate the, the power of, of even just a scare story to, to disrupt your business. 
The flip side is, and I did mention this just before Christmas actually when I was, when I was doing a two minute shtick here, was don't fall prey to wild dog syndrome. So in India I've seen <coughs> companies risk register that said attacked by wild dogs. <laughs> so, well, fairly unlikely, even on the streets of Delhi, let alone within, you know, an IT, um, you know, an IT compound. All right. So let's not get over fanatic here. Asteroid strike, nuclear war. Um, you know, that that was potentially a risk a few years back between, um, you know, India and Pakistan, for instance. But I think that's that's largely subsided. So, you know, don't overrate these. <coughs> The other, comment, the other thing, that's, the thing that's come out a lot over the last sort of 18 months or so, and this is going to lead us neatly into the next one, is you have to plan for failure. Okay? Just because you've got a risk there doesn't mean that's it done. Yeah, these are real risks. They're not just reference points. They don't just earn you a tick in your audit register. You know, when someone comes around, yes, you've got oh, all these risks, fantastic, 400, all oh, extra marks for reaching 400. <laughs> is that has been a failure? I'm sorry? To us being a failure. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially. Um, so you, know, you do have to realise that they are you know, real, not just writing on paper. Think of the real implications. Number two. <laughs> so, okay, so I heard. Okay, what's the name of the film? Terminator! Uh, you'll do. <laughs> and what was the character? T-1000. T-3000. T uh, it's not the answer I've got on my card, I'm afraid. T for two. Mr. C. I think he was named Terminator. after the film. Terminator. Thank you, there we go. Oh. If you we look in the script, if you look in the script, it says the Terminator. It's Terminator. No, the film is The Terminator, yeah. the first one. He did use it in other films as well. Oh. No. <laughs> 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 okay. So what? So, what? so what? I hear you cry. <laughs> <laughs> Risks don't go away. They're all, they will always be back. So even if you do mitigate or manage them or avoid them or transfer them you know, or accept them, especially if you accept them, obviously, but the risks don't just go away, okay? Just because you've managed to reduce that risk, just because you've given that risk to someone else, it's still there. You've still got to track it. You've still got to be very careful about how you take account of, of that risk. They might be somewhere else, they're still present. You need to review them regularly. I know this is kind of a little bit, you know, risk, risk management 101. You need to re re review them at least annually or every time there's a significant change in your business. So if you move your, your offices from Dullesville, Ohio to downtown Bangkok, your, your risk profile is going to change quite considerably. And not only that, the company's risk appetite can change as well. You know, in that example from going from a fairly quiet place to a, you know, an extremely frenetic place, your appetite for risk will change. You probably won't have security guards on your doors. That's not really something you're concerned about in Ohio. You certainly will when you're in downtown ba Bangkok. And the other thing as well is risks. The, the risk itself doesn't always change, but in, in in the reference to, the, to ISO 27005, the likelihood might change, or the ease of exploitation might change. Now, whichever methodology you use, I think the same thing can be applied. So it's not the risk necessarily, the, the, the core risk change, and it's how it's put together, how it's implemented, or even how it's, how it's going to apply to you. Ready? Yeah. Double prizes for this. Treasure of the Sierra Madre. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Give that man a prize. That's fantastic. <laughs> and the name of the character. <laughs> when I was chatting, I was happy Bogart. <laughs> Nobody? Oh, I've so picked on their iPhones already. Holtz. <laughs> Can you say it? Well, it says Holtz. Right, 
I'll do a little bit of um, Lionel Blair. Two words. The first word is a precious metal. Gold. Gold. Second word is something you put on your head. Don't say we. Put it together. Thank you. And give a prize for somebody who can name another actor in that film. Robert Mitchum. Who's that? All right. So what? I hear you cry. So what? Thank you. So the C rest or Prisk, however they pronounce it, doesn't mean you are risk ready. Okay. It reminds me a lot currently of the, the, the sort of the MCSE debacle of many years ago where people were flooding onto the market with an MCSE claiming to be extremely experienced and knew what they were doing and their knowledge was you know an inch deep you know at best it's any and this applies to any qualification I'm not, not taking any kind of a dig at ISAC or anyone else but you know the CISM the, the CISSP all of the other ones what they do is just demonstrate a foundation knowledge and demonstrate that you can take the exam and pass it. They're very useful. You know, I find very often in a, in a master services agreement with a client, they're stating their requirement is that your information security staff must be suitably qualified. This is a fantastic way of demonstrating that qualification. But it doesn't, it, it, it is no substitute for actual experience. It's a great way of getting through the door no doubt about it, but all it does is demonstrate that foundation knowledge, doesn't prove any kind of experience whatsoever. So don't go pinning your hopes on people who have business cards that are very, very long <laughs> to fit all of the letters after their names. You know, it means they can do an awful lot of, of exams and they're very good at the multiple choice selection and things like that, you know, because you know, after a while they become, they, they blur a little, if you will, right? So. Focus on the experience as well as the qualifications. You need to look at them both together. So you're advocating not training our security nope. staff? Well, <laughs> interesting you should say that. <laughs> and we'll come to that one in just a little while. Just don't let them take the exam. No. That's <laughs> no, and, and, that means he's going to think you're going to forget about it. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I take your point. There's nothing wrong with these qualifications, but there is an overemphasis on the qualifications. You know, and I know that there's an awful lot of, you know, furore going on around at the moment around the, you know, ISC squared and their their qualifications at the moment. You know, there's a certain yeah, amount of on. unrest. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Now, are you the fuss about qualifications? I would argue it's almost more of an HR-driven thing than it is for many people in the industry. Because I'm sorry, but. A lot of people I talk to in the field, yeah, we have certs, we don't have certs. It doesn't really matter if you get someone who knows their stuff. Yeah. But to get past the gatekeepers in HR, or Absolutely. my apologies, recruitment consultants sometimes, um, <laughs> those required. No, and I totally agree. I totally agree. And it's a very good demonstration of that foundation of knowledge. But it shouldn't be taken, you know, it opens the door to let you in. It gives comfort to, you know, if you're working in a consultancy or in a client driven model, it gives comfort to the client that they actually, you know, you have the skills in the right place. Absolutely. And I'm, you know, I'm by no means advocating that we should just, you know, tear up our certificates at all. They're very useful. I'm taking an exam in two week, two months' time. You know, so, you know, I couldn't possibly tell you just in case I don't get it. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I just it's putting these into perspective effectively is, is the message that we're putting across here. So, so how do you validate experience? <coughs> That's, isn't that what a good interview is about? Yeah. No, interviews are just a lot of different reasons, but I'm sorry. There are plenty of qualified security consultants, certified or not, who are absolutely rubbish at interviewing. The whole timing. Yeah. Uh, that's a different story entirely. Though. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, for instance, you know, Sapient, where, where I work, our interview process is somewhat lengthy to say the least, and it does give people a chance to, you know, the folks who've got brains the size of a planet but can't tie their shoelaces, it gives them a chance to show their skills and their experience. 
you know, I think they're probably exhausted after about two solid days of interview and things like that. So there are ways and means around it. Yes, interview processes are flawed, looking at, um, or potentially flawed, looking at certificates alone is a flawed way to do it. It's trying to take a balanced approach to this. Number four, how are we doing? One there, and character? David. Who said David Bowman? There you go. <laughs> Dr. David Bowman, good enough. <laughs> so well, thank you. No, someone's on the board. Come on, folks. Help me out here. You can't just rely on technology. <clears throat> Okay, technology can, has done, will always fail, etc., etc. So do humans, right? So that's again why we need to take, you know, a compromise, not compromise, a, 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 a sort of a blended approach to this. You need to complement any technology, technological controls you put in place. You need to complement, you know, with the softer controls, the policies, maybe the security awareness, if you believe in that sort of thing. Training, you know. Um, <laughs> I know some of you out there do. Um, you know, so you need to you need to um, try and blend the two of them together. You know, the, the technology is very good at doing, you know, the arduous and the mundane. You know, it's great with automation, but it does throw up false positives. It does stop things from working when, you know, you really need it to work. And this is where your best data loss prevention solution is really your people and trying to make, turn them into security advocates is rather than trying to turn around. around. Well, awareness may not be the right approach to making them the security advocates. It's not always around security awareness and training. And that's a very big topic in, it, in of itself and one that we're talking oh, yes. about. At What's, the difference? What's the difference? Security <laughs> awareness itself as a concept, I think, is very much, it, it has this uh, view of it's classroom driven, it's CBT. You have to do this as well as your ethics training, your anti-bribery anti training. And if I want to, if I want to um, you know, put a, an expense claim in, I have to do a 20 or 30 minute training course on that. And if I, want to, you know, if I want to know how to use the help desk, I have to do a course on that, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so before you know it, it becomes, it's just banal, and people will work around it. Um, so that's what security training is, not, not security awareness. It's, I'm sorry. So that's what security training yes. is, not what security awareness is. No, but well, you, you can often combine security awareness training or whatever, but I guess what I'm saying is that you put the two, to, you, if you look at different approaches to the awareness, it's not just sitting them in a classroom once a year while they pass around the cheat sheet to answer all the questions. So what are you well, suggesting? Awesome. Are you saying we should actually in do this, social engineering calls and see if they're working? I think in this particular presentation, yeah. I'm not suggesting anything. Shift the line. Man, it's time to look down, time's vision. Absolutely. Um, but effectively, you know, that, as a to, to repeat that point, you know, data loss prevention and your people is, is the best chance that you've got before it even hits the technology for it to throw up that false positive. Big topic though, very happy to talk about it afterwards. <coughs> Number five, we hit the halfway mark. Six cents. Six cents. Cole Hellman? Cole. A little boy from Six time of this film, this three year old boy just learned to talk to walk up to strangers and say, I see dead people. <laughs> so, what is this one? I hear you cry. We're going to get this right on number 10, aren't we? So, professional burnout. This is something, again, it's become a bit of a topic over the last 12 to 18 months. Not as much of a topic as I would have 
you know, like to see, but it's something that's getting very commonplace in the information security risk management, in this whole kind of sphere around here. It's, it's starting to become more recognized. The reference there, and you, you can get the slides after, the reference there um, is uh, links to a survey that was carried out and a, and a campaign, which seems a little bit short-lived, but a campaign to try and address this. <coughs> Apparently, 70 to 80 hours a week is normal for many folks in this industry. And the, re the reason for that is job creep and you know, um, split responsibilities is a very common theme in what we do. So you very often find the IT guy is also responsible for IT security as well. Or the finance group, the CFO, it says we need to implement you know, ISO 27001 and that goes down to someone with his, within his team. And so you end up with this split personality tr trying to do two entirely separate, somewhat related but separate jobs with only so many hours in a day. The best part of it is there's never an end in sight. There's always another virus. There's always more risk. There's always an incident. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. And so, you know, as a result, people just end up putting in more and more hours, and the burnout side of things is, is something that's a little bit of a concern. Suffice to say, the economy has made this a lot worse these days as well. Um, you know, people fearing for their jobs, you know, um, less jobs around, so they're willing to take on these extra, these extra hours and the extra responsibilities for job security. So this is something that I think is going to become a bigger and bigger problem as we, as we move forward. I'd like to say I saw this 18 months ago, not at all, I was too busy at the time. <laughs> but uh, I think it's going to become a bigger problem as we go. Are you excited for those jobs though? I, I don't know many people that work those few hours. <laughs> 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 hey! That's an agency job, not eight. <laughs> <laughs> Ready? Well, nudge someone then. Nudge. Yeah. You're up. I think you're Andy. Yes, we So over there. Technically, couldn't you attribute to the first animated Hobbit from like the 1980s? Could do. Could do. I, I didn't know. This is the first one I found. Because you could have said the Hobbit, I'd have accepted that as well. We've got lots of pens to get through. <laughs> He's been doing eight hours a week. Yes. <laughs> Pass you will. So, so look after your data. There's a five questions here, and each of these oh, there are there there are. Now it's five questions here, and you should be able to answer every single one of these questions regarding all of your precious data, perhaps we'll call it you know, personal information for the sake of argument, right? Theoretically, you know what systems your data is in. You know what country it resides in. When you actually get down to practice, you've got HR teams, you've got hiring teams, you've got you know, legal departments and finance departments. You talk to them and you say, well, where do you put this payroll information? Oh, well, we store it on an Excel file on this server. Where is that server? I don't know. Where do you put this? We put it on a SharePoint. Where's the SharePoint? I don't know. And you often, before you know it, you've got you know EU personal data being stored on a server in you know in North America somewhere or in Brazil or somewhere like that. Not a problem if you've got the right controls in place and the right legal controls. Binding corporate rules is one such example. But if you haven't, this could come round and bite you on the bum. And as soon as you start digging, literally the more you dig, the more you find as you start doing this. You start creating a data map. Yeah. But, but even, even though you may go through due, due diligence, you have no um, reliance on the, that third party. It's not then going to subcontract and subcontract and subcontract. So, you know, at the end of the day, you can do what you can do but you have no idea what they're doing behind the scenes. Well, you can establish contractual terms with whoever it is that you have got those agreements with. China and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, well, 
in that case, perhaps not deal with those particular <laughs> companies. Uh, yes, you're right. But you can do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, point taken. Um, but no, I, I, I do totally acknowledge that. I mean, we, you know, we try and put in you know, contractual terms that make sure that the data stays where we first wanted it to stay. And if they notify us of a change, we have the right to terminate the contract move elsewhere. Not always possible. Depends on the size and the clout of the organisation. Depends on the type of group you're looking for. But you, perhaps the most important thing, you have done your due diligence. You know where it is at a given point. No, you, ex you hope it's where. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's now we're coming into sort of vendor management, right? You need to be in control of your vendors. You know, perhaps we'll talk about that another time. Isn't there another one as well about? Do you know who's got access management or what? Who's got yes. Access? Absolutely, I, I set myself to five bullets though, because that's the number you should have on a slide. <laughs> but no, that's a very good point. You know, who has access to it? The, the, the correct access to it. You know, another one that, 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 that uh, you know, nearly made the cut, but uh, didn't quite. Um, and this is a this is a, a point in time where you know, InfoSec and Risk have to start talking to the lawyers. You know, there are. You know, legal um, frameworks in place that have to be established for you to transfer data to the SharePoint server in North America or Mexico and back again without any, you know, basically without having to fill in any paperwork. Otherwise, theoretically, it's a, you know, arduous at best before you do it. But so it's also procurement because they may be the ones that actually sign the contract. Yes. You get legal and so on and so forth. You know, you've got that other entity that they may be driven by cost control and everything else, irrespective of what you're dealing with. I'd like to think that procurement are doing their deals in consultation. <laughs> I'd like to think, I, it's, it's, you know, it'll be a happy day when such things happen. I know, I know. <laughs> I have to say, this is one of the things we have got right. We have a very good relationship with our procurement team. We're always on the RFP process. We're always in that analysis. But yes, there's certain organisations, you know, never the twain shall meet. Absolutely. Lots and lots of gotchas. But at least ask these questions about your data. And if, if you can't answer positively to them, understand why not and where those problems are. Why do you care how long you've had the data for? Surely it's more important as to how much longer you should have it for, or the well, of the data? The, 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 reason for long the, had it. the reason for the length of it is, in some cases, under certain privacy law, you need to only keep certain information for as long as it is required. Yeah. And so you'll often come across drawfuls of, you know, CVs and review notes, and, you know, people that you've turned down, you know, in the case of hiring and recruiting, or you know, um, payroll records of ex-employees and things like that. You need to keep it for the requisite legal amount of time, it's seven years or whatever. Some things you should dispose of as soon as you no longer need it. And that could be six months, three months a day, who knows. But it is important, never hold on to this stuff for longer than you should. You know, if, you, if you're holding on to it, you can lose it. If you get rid of it as soon as you can, destroy it, then much more difficult to lose. You talk, you, sorry, you talk about members of staff get rid of them as soon as <laughs> you see, You're seeing through the, the, uh, the warm the outer shell here. <laughs> Another point for vendors is yes. if, you, if you are going into contract with vendors, then you insert the right to audit and then you go in there and say, right, where is our data? Absolutely. And, and if they don't give you satisfactory answers, then no, absolutely. There's a lot of mechanisms you can use. Of course that means, you know, cooperating and working with the lawyers to make sure that that clause is inserted in the contract in the first place. Many vendors, BT is one of them, you know, even basic stuff versus the contract. Tough. If you don't want it, if you don't want to sign it, you can go away somewhere else. You see that all the time on lesser issues. But uh... Right, moving on. Before you lynch me between, get between the food and this. <laughs> right, so I'm going to take the team. I'm going to take the team. I'm going to take the team. Sorry? She's in the bodyguard. Give the man a pen. Give the man a pen. Oh, that's good. I'll take two answers.
answers for who said it because Hollywood being Hollywood changed the person who actually said the line. So I'll take two answers. So who said Apollo 13? Tom Hanks. Forrest Gump. Does nobody want these pens? No. No. That's not yet. Jim Lovell. Jim Lovell said it in the film, Jack Swigert said it in real life. So you're saying that Jim never actually said it? No, he didn't. Jack Swigert said it. In real life. Okay. <laughs> So, there should be a question mark on the end of that, let's yeah. cut it off a little bit. <coughs> so, is your risk management and incident management program, or are your incident management and risk management programs connected in any way, shape or form? They do very similar things there. Um, you know, they both, they both identify and detect risks and issues, right? They, you know, one does it proactively, one does it reactively. Hopefully your risk management program is, is feeding to a certain extent scenarios that could be happening for the incident management team to be prepared for. Theoretically, if you're doing your job right as in risk management, the incident management guys should know exactly the sort of things that are likely to happen, theoretically. It doesn't always happen. Very often the two are entirely separate um, activities. You know, one's carried out by you know, the audit group, and the other is carried out by the IT guys. You know, we've got disaster recovery, that's IT, right? We've got, you know, business continuity management, that's IT, and a little bit of HR thrown in. You know, risk management, it often comes, uh, you know, I sort of welcome any feedback here, but it often comes under a financial umbrella, because it comes out of an audit function. So you end up with two entirely different groups of people not talking to each other. So the incident management folks are preparing for things that actually are not real risks, you know, as far as the risk management folks are concerned. But you've got risk management dealing with pre-incident, and you've got the, post, uh, the incident management people dealing with post incident Absolutely. Proactive and reactive. Exactly. It, it's... it's, it's well, it's, it's so simple, surely. Yeah. Now, it, but it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you know, deserves saying, and it, it, it's, it's might be you know, the school of the bleeding obvious, but really, if you can get those two teams to talk together, we're not talking about you know, massive frameworks set up to bond the two groups together and the spreadsheets from here to the SharePoint to that. No, just, just get the teams to talk. Here. No, just bring them here. Yeah. So you get pissed up and they're being bonded. <coughs> Well, you know, that was actually not far off what I was going to say. <laughs> if you have them, the teams even sat next to each other in the office and communicating to each other. At least that way, you're going to start to spread some of that, you know, the knowledge that's being garnered by the risk management side, feed it into the incident management side, and vice versa as well. At the end of an incident, how else can we, you know, perhaps reduce our risk? How else could we address this risk slightly differently? So wouldn't they all be reporting to no, not usually, no, no. If you've got an audit, an audit, you can tell the audit function that manages risk, they would report to the audit. Why would audit manage risk management? I'm sorry, I don't understand. If it's IT risk management, why would it be under audit? But risk management can, not, can could cover everything. It could cover economic risk, you know, it could cover uh, social, environmental risk, it could, you know, all sorts of things, which is why it often comes out of an internal audit function, which often comes out of a, a financial function. Yeah. If they are all reporting to the CISO, then fantastic. You know, I think you know it makes absolute sense. But you know, a lot of the he just the CISO. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's another thing. Another thing is what's the difference between an incident and a security incident? Yeah. It depends how you define it, how you well, define it. Yeah. How would you define it? No, how would you define it in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. But therefore, if the IT little guy is the service guy who builds it, you might hear about it because you're... Yeah. Sorry, can you just repeat that? 
So it's, it's, it's not always, security incidents are not always reported as security incidents. It's just an incident. Something's broken, something's gone wrong. Not, something's broken and we've let someone in. So it comes down to the IT guys to, to fix it. I, I, I don't agree, actually. I, I think if you can't report security things correctly, that comes down to a failing in the, the ISMS or the IMS. It comes down to an organisational failure. Or the security in awareness. Of, yeah, in terms of communicating the policies and procedures around what a security institution should be. Yeah, actually, absolutely. I actually disagree with both of those. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. We, we, we can't go around the room like this. No, 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 sorry, go on. In many cases, it's a failure of the incident management guys. So they're not training the guys who have to be reporting the incident who recognize what you're looking at. Yes, true. Sure right. And the problem is how to follow up with it. That, no, that's the incident absolutely. management is always have a subject. That I'll take the case from your book. Moving swiftly on. Dirty dog. Dirty dog. Dirty dog. Dirty dog. Dirty dog. Dirty dog. And who was the character? Johnny Castle. Yes! Oh, yeah. Give it some dirty dog. Give it some dirty dog. Come on. Man in the corner there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So oh, oh, what? Oh, oh, what? I hear you cry. <coughs> Manage your risks from the top down. Your organisational structure will often define your success in managing risks. And I think this we've touched upon this quite a few times here. So who do you escalate your enterprise risks to? Does it sort of veer off to one side of the pyramid before it you know, reaches no further, or does it go right to the very top you know, of, of the food chain, as it were? Yeah, and there needs to be a formal process of escalation of those risks in the first place. Okay, so at all levels of the organization, when a risk is, is you know, identified, different levels of the organization should be able to you know, sign off on those risks or deal with those risks, etc. And so in the end, the top risks, the riskiest risks, get bubbled up to the top to be dealt with by the senior most people, the ones who have more money, theoretically more experience, or who have, you know, can actually apply more resources to fixing the risk. However, if the tone at the top, a phrase that's used throughout the industry, if that tone at the top is wrong, and they're not addressing those risks, they're not interested in you know, um, the two risks that get bubbled up a year. I mean, you, you could have hundreds of risks, but actually only two get, end up going all the way to the top. If they're not interested in dealing with those risks once or twice a year, that effect bubbles down. And sooner or later, you find that nobody's willing to deal with a risk when they come across it, because nobody feels empowered to do so. Nobody feels that they can deal with the risk at all levels. So again, you're, if you, if your, um, to, to put it back to the movie, if your enterprise risk program gets put into the corner and the risks that get bubbled up do not get dealt with, it's going to affect all of the risks eventually. I think the bigger problem is that people don't want to go to the big boss, so they try to underestimate <coughs> a risk in order to be able to get signed off at a lower level. Absolutely, and there's two things to know. One is, escalation is often seen as a dirty word, and it's not. Escalation is about putting it to someone who can apply a different or a greater amount of resources to fix a problem. You often see, you know, escalation is going above someone. Or things like that. There's, a, there's a counterbalance to that, which is when you escalate it, then there's a, a culture in city management to not want to actually get involved in it. Oh, it's a risk, oh, I'm, I'm only here then. Yeah, because nobody really wants to put their, their neck on the line, so to speak, say, you know what, but I we'll accept that risk or we won't, or, you know, the actual really tangible business decisions that come out of the risk management process. Absolutely. And the other yeah. part to that, sorry, yes. that question, I'm sorry, I'll come straight back to it. The other part to that question is trying to establish those structures, an enterprise risk committee comprising of the C-level execs at the top who will meet once a quarter and will talk about risks. It doesn't take much in reality. You know, when they're actually sat around the table four times a year for half an hour, it doesn't take much. Of course, trying to arrange that will probably take you about a year. <coughs> so, in a combination of ensuring you've got the environment to help the people at the top succeed, plus the fact that you need to be comfortable escalating them, will help actually help your entire risk structure. Yes. And, and, and once you've got that in place, the, the key to engage is to use the 
right language mm. to engage yes. their, their emotional response <coughs> to understand, and then, they, and then they will respond. Absolutely, you have to talk in the language of the board. Yeah. And you know, I think there's courses out there that you can take that will actually, you know, help. You know, Password bingo. Exactly. It is. It is absolutely. Yeah. But if they don't understand, if you're talking about some esoteric, you know, um, synergistic. <laughs> I actually, I was, was going to some esoteric IT issue. Right? They're not going to get it. If you talk about that iPad you've got in front of you. I can, ha you know, that data is not safe, and you know, here's your wife's mobile phone number, sort of thing. For <laughs> 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 example, just so I don't disagree with everything in their top line or their bottom line, then they really pay attention. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I totally agree. Yes. Just so I don't disagree with everything. <laughs> uh, say that this isn't a new problem. Well, this isn't a new problem, but I totally agree with what we're saying about this. It's not even board level, though. I mean, taking a page from people who have been dealing with this for a long time. Look at general IT project management. Look at how many of them fail, go over budget, so on down the line. There is some really experienced IT project manager who wrote about this. I cannot for the life of me remember his name. If someone could tell me, I could find his blog again. He coined it the thermal client of truth, and it's well before board level. It's the senior project managers or the program managers who don't want to admit to their board level superiors that things are off track, and yes. they just tell people to get it done. Yes. But the point is, since this problem has existed, we're not, IT sec is not, we can take a page from whatever they've done to solve it, which isn't much true, but we can see what we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Totally agree. I also heard a new term today. Oh, yes. Is to you talked to the board in terms of risk um, ROI, meaning risk of incarceration. Risk. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Very true. Right. Moving swiftly on. Number nine. We're nearly there, folks. Now, come on. We've got a lot of pens to get through. <laughs> Golfing. Yeah. Yeah. Someone over here had one. There you go. Oh, Mr. Bond, I expected to die. It's one of my favourite quotes ever. So, oh, we're losing it. The energy's going. Don't reveal your internal documents. I tell you that the the, the link to that first bullet point is um. You click on the link and it shows you documents, confidential, internal, all over the internet, all over Google. You know, losing this stuff is, you know, at best embarrassing, at worst it results in competitive loss, bad media, financial loss, fines, etc., etc. You know, and there's some very straightforward things that can be done. I say very simple things. It's very easy to say these things, but things that you really need to put into place. Think, simple things like categorizing your documents. Very simple. <laughs> you know, um, internal, confidential, public. A, you know, a three-way categorization. And then informing people through the soft controls and policy and, you know, however else you want to inform about what that means, what they can do with the documents and things like that. You can put the technology in as well, DLP helps, obviously, and all, all that sort of good stuff, which looks for these things. But the stuff that floods out onto the internet on a regular basis is, is really quite horrific. So, so sure that the default is internal, not public. Exactly, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. absolutely. It is, but it's, it's educating people to actually respect that as well. And yes. You know, I'm going through a similar process at the moment, and it's, it's actually really challenging because you, wanna, you don't want to inhibit the business, but at the same time, Almost kind of are. You're asking them to put a set of controls around the documentation that yeah. ordinarily would be almost instinctive. You're asking them to actually formalise that process and actually think, oh, you know what, this is actually confidential. Whereas ordinarily that would be in the hands of whoever manages whatever piece of work is going on. Well, of course it is. Yeah. But no one else underneath them will know. And I think there's a real challenge there about getting senior management to accept the fact there's an administrative overhead yes. to implementing this kind of solution. But, but the catch is you don't know what's going on. Most, most people don't spend any time looking at what's going out through the network. Mm -hmm. So when they look at stuff and they publish it internally on the corporate network, they've got no idea about all the gateways that the corporate network has. Yeah. And what about that? Um, Ser seriously, try, do, try doing a Google search for site, colon, and then your corporate domain. But to be honest, uh, most of the corporate people don't care 
best example is Sony, who lost uh, mm. half a million mm. credit cards. Uh, I think they care now, don't uh, they? A hundred thousand PlayStation Network accounts, yeah. uh, whatever. It's, 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 worth, it's, it's worse than that, seriously. If you, if you, if you do stuff like that on a corporate domain, you'll find, you'll find uh, mobile numbers for people that will approve emergency change controls. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. Potentially. Yeah. <laughs> Glad everybody agrees. Moving on. It's the last one. We're nearly on the home stretch. Do we have pins? Right, Burgundy. Yes. Who said Ron Burgundy? Yeah. And what's the name of the film? Anchorman. Yes. It's got a blade, but it's not wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It is, he says it there. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, we got the last one in. So I like this, I like this one a lot. The statistics, we often use statistics, you know, talking in the language of the board, you know, we've done 96% sales increase on pure and oil, all that sort of thing. Those first two, I, I did a search for these on, on Monday night, and they're both from um, security trading companies. And the first one said, reduce phishing click-throughs by 75%, which means if I spend thousands of dollars with them, the 10,000 people in my organization, 2,500 of them will still be clicking through on phishing emails <laughs> at the end of it. The second one, a, a different site, you know, um, quoted Fox Entertainment, they're saying we've successfully trained over 7,000 employees. When I searched on Monday night, they had 12,500 employees <laughs> in their organization. Quite why they're only training 7,000 of them and why they're thinking that's a fantastic thing, I don't know. So <clears throat> bear in mind, on the one side, if a vendor is talking to you, statistics are always used to scare you into buying something, or to encourage you into buying something. Look how good we are. I've had this conversation a few years back with, with, with my boss who happened to be in Boston, so he was over the phone, but I said, we've got, it's fantastic, we've got 96% uptake on the security awareness training after two months, we're doing really well. Okay, what about the other 400 people that haven't taken it? That's what I'm interested in. You know, not the 96%, the 400. And it's my wife who taught me this, because I used to, you know, go to the supermarket, oh, chocolate, low-fat chocolate bars, 80% fat-free. That's 20% fat. Okay, so... Yeah, and then she tell me to put it back. But, um, but it's, it's about under, if you can't reverse the statistic and sell it to yourself again, don't use it. Uh, use it responsibly. Don't use the stats to bluff people. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a well. <laughs> I think it's important to note as well that actually you've quoted some kind of yeah, damn lies in those first two points, but there are also some important stats out there that can help you enforce your business case. Use. Use them carefully and responsibly. Very, very powerful. Again, talking in the language of the board, yeah. they will they will understand. There's there's, there's another quote by Norman Lamont, which is interesting quite about statistics. He said, "Statistics are like bikinis. It's what they don't show that's interesting, not what they show." But it covers the same area. <laughs> stretch that's it there's no more risk stuff to be talked about this is just we've got four films there's a theme going on here you might get it by hopefully the second one <laughs> name the film we'll hand them out pens out we'll hand at least two out to whoever shouts <laughs> out first okay and we've got a few left they're good pens though aren't they yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's absolutely <laughs> <laughs> Risky business. Yes. Yes. There was another one over there. I have one already. So. Then hand it to a neighbour. <laughs> <laughs> it was the guy with the beard. <laughs> Absolutely. Risky business. Are we getting the theme here? No. <laughs> Name this film. Nixon. Yes! 
We've got a Jean-Claude Van Damme fan. <laughs> The Brussels from Brussels. What was the film? What was the film? Max Brussels. Oh. I will give as many pens as the individual wants if they get this next one. A clue, it's a Bollywood movie. But it's an English title, it's on the same theme. Risk. Risk it for a biscuit. No. <laughs> Someone said it. Someone said it. Risk. 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 Risk.